history. Good evening and welcome to the first annual Open University BBC4 History Lecture. Our lecturer tonight is one of the most distinguished scholars currently working in Britain, Ian Kershaw, who is Professor of Modern History at the University of Sheffield. I've had the great privilege of working closely with Ian on a variety of television projects over the last 10 years or so, and I can certainly vouch for the fact that he isn't just a brilliant academic, he's a first-rate communicator as well. In fact, once at a public gathering of historians, I think I may have damaged his career very slightly by suggesting he would have also made an excellent television producer. Ian, of course, is one of the world experts, though, if not the single greatest expert on the life and times of Adolf Hitler. His two-volume epic biography of the Nazi dictator is now the standard text on the subject. And he's speaking tonight, appropriately enough, on the 60th anniversary of Hitler's suicide in a lecture entitled, Hitler's Place in History. And I think I can safely promise that on this particular subject, there's no one else on the planet who we ought to be listening to more. After Ian's talked, there'll be the chance to ask him some questions. But first, can I ask you to give a very warm welcome to Professor Ian Kershaw. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and thank you very much for such a warm reception. And I'd also like to say thank you to Lawrence Rees for his generous introduction, and also thank you to the BBC and to the Open University for doing me the honour of asking me to deliver this lecture. And what a fantastic bunker to give the lecture in, don't you think? <laughs> Truly authentic atmosphere. And it's in the bunker, though now the Berlin bunker, that I'd just like briefly to begin in those dramatic days of April 1945. And on the 30th of April, sometime between about half past three and four o'clock in the afternoon, Hitler shot himself. Eva Braun, or as we should say, since her marriage the previous day, officially Eva Hitler, took poison at the same time. It was another week before Germany surrendered and it would be another four months before the brutal war in the Far East came to an end, but uh, Hitler's death marked the symbolic end of the Second World War. German capitulation had been impossible as long as Hitler was alive and now within hours of his death the inmates of the bunker were vainly attempting to seek a capitulation with the commander of the Red Army in Berlin. For them, Hitler was already history. All they could think about now was saving their own skins. And that's much the same for the Nazi grandees who turned up ten days earlier in the bunker to offer Hitler their congratulations on his 56th birthday. They thought exactly the same way. The end was now so obviously near they just couldn't wait to get away. All they wanted to do was survive, not join Hitler in his Götterdämmerung. Göring was one of the first to be off, hot-footing it as soon as it was, was decent for southern Germany. He was wearing a, a drab khaki outfit, not his usual resplendent silver grey. Somebody said he looked just like an American general. Ribbentrop, Himmler, Speer and others all offered Hitler perfunctory congratulations and then got out of there as fast as they could. You could perhaps say that it was one of the few occasions in history where the sinking ship deserted the rat. On the 22nd of April 1945, something sensational happened in the bunker. 
Hitler's voice reverberated through the walls and the corridors in an uncontrollable outburst of white-hot fury. He'd been betrayed on all sides, he clamoured. The war was lost. Nobody had heard anything like it before. One of the things that really struck me when I was working on my biography was how Hitler was able so consistently and for so long to hang on to this fiction that the war could still be won. It was, by any stretch of the imagination, really an extraordinary display of willpower. Now that itself is quite remarkable, don't you think? Here we are in April 1945, the Reich is collapsing in ruins around him, the Russians are at the door, Germany had been suffering defeat on defeat, catastrophe on catastrophe for two years, and nobody had ever heard Hitler say that defeat was now likely. But now he gave up. He was openly resigned to defeat. But uh, he refused to leave the bunker, and that meant the bunker inmates were now condemned to wait with him for the inevitable. Red Army drawing closer every day. But as long as Hitler lived, there was no escape. So for the poor old bunker inmates, the main topic of conversation was now how to commit suicide. Hitler, for his part, saw treason, betrayal all around him. Goering was peremptorily thrown out of the party for suggesting that he might take control if Hitler remained incapacitated in Berlin. The last straw for Hitler was the news that Himmler had been trying to do a deal with the Western Allies. Himmler's own sense of loss of reality matched that of Hitler himself. He thought that he might still play a leading role in Germany's future struggle alongside the Western powers against Bolshevism. Himmler's only worry at this time was when he met Eisenhower, should he bow or shake hands? Well, during the night of the 29th to the 30th of um, April, Hitler dictated his testament and then in a weird nocturnal service married Eva Braun, his uh, mistress of many years. The next morning, Hitler told his orderlies that he and Eva Braun would kill themselves that day. And he gave instructions out about their cremation, about the burning of the bodies and disposal of the bodies. Around about half past three that afternoon, Hitler and Eva Braun withdrew, gave their last farewells, then withdrew into their uh, private quarters. For about ten minutes or so, nothing could be heard except the humming of the ventilators in the bunker. And then Heinz Linger, Hitler's uh, chief orderly, plucked up the courage to enter Hitler's room. And there he found Hitler and Eva Braun slumped on a sofa. There was a pool of blood on the floor which trickled from the hole in the right side of Hitler's head and a distinctive smell of bitter almonds wafted up from the body of Eva Braun. Now I did uh, wonder whether we should be noting, even noting the 60th anniversary of um, Hitler's squalid end at all. I've got quite a bit of sympathy, really, with those people who say we already hear far too much about Hitler. Maybe we should remind ourselves of what lies behind this sometimes near-obsessive preoccupation with Hitler. And I think it boils down more or less to this. No single individual in the 20th century left such an imprint as Hitler did on that century. We can see now that the Second World War was a defining, it was a, perhaps the defining episode of that century. It fundamentally reshaped the balance of world power. It's, it had left about 50 million victims and up to two-thirds of those were civilians. There's been no other war, war like it in history. Its main author was Adolf Hitler. And the other defining episode emerged within the context of that war. The murder of the Jews and of the others the Nazis deemed racially undesirable, what we now call the Holocaust. In intent, in planning, in method, in scale, no other genocide like it throughout the whole sum of human history. Its main author, again, was Adolf Hitler. 
Well, these alone, I think, are reasons why we should take the anniversary of Hitler's death to reflect briefly upon his place in history. How did Hitler himself see his place in history? It's in fact harder to answer that question, certainly for the last years of his life, than we might at first sight think. To do so, we've got to remind ourselves of the central, of the essential main driving force behind his political career, so-called. And this career was indeed truly astonishing. In the first half of his life, he was an absolute nobody, a total zero. In the second half, he made the world hold its breath, and he wrought destruction on Europe, unmatched even by Attila the Hun. Hitler was made by one war. He fought another to undo its consequences. First war left in him an extraordinary will to destruction. The second war, his war, saw him carry out that destruction. And the more I've looked at this stuff, the more I've become increasingly convinced that the First World War was the crucial episode in Hitler's life, the crucial episode, but not as he himself described it. He always spoke of it as the best years of his life, but I doubt very much that he really experienced it in that way. Like so many soldiers, he'd gone into the First World War with enormous enthusiasm and great passion for Germany's cause. But like so many, he soon had to live with death and destruction all around him on a daily basis. In fact, in the very baptism of fire of his own regiment, already in the autumn of 1914, he lost 80%, four out of five of his comrades. Astonishing. And for, for four years, with hardly a break, he witnessed this carnage at first hand. He became, in this time, hardened to human loss. Hardened to human loss on this colossal scale, indifferent to suffering, indifferent to death. And he associated that with a thought that was with him from the beginning of the war, I think. In 1915, in one of the few letters that Hitler sent home from the front, he said that the sacrifices would be worthwhile if they brought about in his words, a purer homeland, a homeland purged of alien elements. And more than three years later, when he was in hospital recovering from mustard gas poisoning, he was shocked to the very core of his being by the totally unexpected news for him, as for many, of Germany's defeat and of the socialist revolution that followed it. So the terrible sacrifice had been in vain after all. That couldn't be true, surely. Hitler looked for an explanation, and he found a scapegoat. The First World War was a time when Hitler's existing, more or less conventional, anti-Semitism became pathological, proto-genocidal. Hatred of the Jews was mounting sharply throughout the war, and it gripped Hitler at this time as never before, not even in his Vienna years when he was a down and out in Vienna. The reasons for the war and the reasons for the disgrace, as he saw it, for the disgrace of Germany's defeat now became crystal clear to him. The Jews were to blame for the war itself, but also, and even more so, for what Hitler saw as Germany's shameful capitulation in November 1918. Hitler was um, a convert to the stabbing the back legend before that legend was even invented. He believed the Germans, that the Germans had been undermined by the Jews from the beginning. And, of course, undermined by this running sore from within. And it's the first known statement we have, written statement of Hitler from as early as September 1919, said, the ultimate aim of a national government had to be the removal of the Jews altogether. And in Mein Kampf, in the mid-1920s, he wrote that the sacrifice of Germany's best men could have been avoided if, at the beginning of the First World War, some 12 or 15,000 Hebrew corruptors 
have been held under poison gas. Terrible words. But the link between the Jews and the war was indelibly etched upon Hitler's mind. And the Jews for Hitler were all-powerful. They were running Western capitalism. They were directing Bolshevism. Above all, they were wrecking Germany. So another war for Hitler had to be a war against the Jews. It had to be the unfinished business of the First World War. More than anything else, it had to expiate, to atone for, the shame of the capitulation of November 1918. So what's crucial to note um, for, I, I think, is this point. That for Hitler, the Second World War was revenge for the first. And as the Second World War loomed, in January 1939, on the sixth anniversary of his takeover of power, speaking in the Reichstag in Berlin, Hitler, he said, if international Jewish financiers should succeed in plunging the nations once more into world war, then the result would be not the Bolshevizing of the earth and thus the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. Now this wasn't um, propaganda, nor was it a prior announcement of the final solution. But it did reveal Hitler's intrinsic genocidal mentality. It highlighted his own certainty that the next war would bring about somehow, he wasn't sure how, but somehow the destruction of the Jews. And Hitler went on to cite this so-called prophecy on at least a dozen occasions in the following years as the Jews of Europe being engulfed in the final solution. And so did some of his acolytes as well refer over and over again to this prophecy of the Führer, as they saw it. And another point, Hitler always misdated this prophecy. He always put it down to the 1st of September 1939, the day of the German invasion of Poland, the day the war began, a day when, in his speech, he never mentioned the Jews with a single word. So, for Hitler, the genocide against the Jews wasn't something separate from the war, it was central to the war itself. So it was only logical then that on the night before his death, when he was dictating his testament, he pointed out again that the nation had to continue the fight against the Jews. And he said in this testament that this time he'd left no one in any doubt whatsoever. The sacrifices wouldn't take place without the real culprit having to atone for his guilt. So for Hitler, the war wasn't a, uh, a conventional, it wasn't a conventional struggle. The war was an apocalyptic fight, an apocalyptic struggle for revenge and for salvation. And I think it's important to hang on to this point because it links to the way in which Hitler saw his own place in history. In his uh, typical dualistic fashion, Hitler always posed only stark alternatives, total victory or total defeat. By early 1945, obviously, total victory was long since out of the question. Total defeat loomed and wasn't far off. Why did Hitler then, why did Hitler reject outright the suggestions coming from Goebbels, Ribbentrop, Goering, Himmler and others to negotiate an end to the war with one side or the other? Well, one reason, of course, was his vain hope that sometime or other the anti-German alliance would split. He dreamt that one last victory would do the job. One last victory would concentrate the minds of the West on the need to join Germany in the future war, future fight against Bolshevism. He said over and over again he would only negotiate from a position of strength. By 1945, of course, such hopes were long since illusory. But Hitler wasn't stupid, nor did he have such um, a loss of grip on reality that he couldn't see what anybody else could see, i.e. that the war was absolutely hopelessly lost. Of course, he knew that he personally was an obstacle to any negotiations, that uh, he couldn't survive any negotiated settlement, that was obvious, nor could he allow himself to fall into the hands of the enemy. But he could, at any point, have killed himself, and that would have saved the calamitous losses 
that were taking place in these last months of the war. These were losses greater than on scale than at any other in any other year of the conflict. He killed himself only when the Russians were almost literally at the very door. So why hold out until then in such an obviously lost cause? Well, one reason was certainly um, his unheroic uh, determination, but maybe natural, you might say, to hang on to uh, life, whatever the cost to others. But Hitler wasn't uh, a coward, and he'd said many times how easy it'd be to put a bullet through his head and end the misery. So we come back to what Hitler thought he was fighting the war for and to his view of his place in history. The war for Hitler couldn't conceivably be ended by a compromise peace. For him, another sellout, another capitulation, the mark of cowardice that would defile the nation yet again. The very purpose of the war had been to expunge the capitulation of November 1918. There'll be no repeat of November 1918, he stated over and over and over again, the war can last as long as it wants. Germany will never capitulate. And this wasn't propaganda, he really meant it. And he told his uh, Luftwaffe adjutant, uh, Nikolaus von Bielow, at the end of 1944, we'll not capitulate, ever. We can go down, but we'll take a world with us. And this really sums up Hitler towards the end, I think. Honor in defeat, holding out right to the bitter end, heroic death, maximum destruction of the enemy. These were what Hitler wanted to bequeath as his legacy to what he somewhat pathetically called the coming man. This was Hitler's own view of his place in history as defeat became inevitable. How different this was from the place that he'd once imagined for himself, his place in history that he saw as in Germany's glory years in, in the 1930s. In March 1939, as German troops were occupying what was left of Czechoslovakia, Hitler said, I'll go down in history as the greatest German, and that would surely have been the case if Germany won the war. And even in the early 1950s, astonishingly enough, according to surveys done at the time, round about a quarter of Germans still had, in some way or another, a good opinion about Hitler. We can now see that this destructive will was really the key to Hitler's character, but that scarcely explains his uh, mass appeal in the 1930s. For that, we have to uh, acknowledge, however repellent it is to us, we have to acknowledge a visionary side to Hitler, maybe a creative side even. Certainly that's what the first spin doctor, Dr. Josef Goebbels, exploited in building up the image of the great leader. In a society gripped by paranoia of national decline and, and decadence, Hitler offered a breathtaking vision of Germany's future. It was a vision of regeneration, resurgence and redemption, a vision of grandeur and glory and millions were taken in by it, were enthralled by it. The vision was underpinned by the aesthetics of power. These were new and they were spectacular. Albert Speer, Hitler's uh, favorite architect, was one of those who were swept away by the grandiose perspectives, by what he himself saw as the monumentalization of history. Hitler, of course, had wanted to be an architect and an artist, and he was now measure up, mesmerized by building plans, and it was now a case that he could put his extraordinary fantasies into practice, and they, they reflected an amazing gigantomania. Plans for the new capital of Germany to replace Berlin, Germania, as it would have been called. They had at the center an assembly hall 16 times bigger than St. Peter's and the Vatican to hold 180,000 people with a dome far outstretching any previous dome known in history, reaching to 726 feet. Money, no object. What mattered, Hitler told Speer, was building for eternity. The monuments had to be there as a lasting monument to Germany's glory. They should be there for future generations, like the pyramids of Egypt stood as testimony 
to the greatness of the pharaohs. And in many other spheres as well, Hitler really released enormous pent-up energies. He made the unimaginable all at once seem possible. So, one example, engineers were thrilled at the prospect of creating huge trains running on wide-gauge tracks, far outweighing in their, outstretching in their glory and grandeur anything that uh, Virgin Pendolinos can offer. And these were going to carry German holiday makers right down to the Crimea and then bring them back again for their, their cream teas in Munich and Berlin where they'd be doubtless waited on by Slav helots. Doctors too relished the chance that Hitler gave them, the chance now to experiment not just on animals but on humans. And this of course was the reality behind the fantastic vision. It meant a, a seismic break with the Judeo-Christian humanitarian values that have been the very basis, the pivot of European civilization. Hitler rejected the softness of Christianity as well as he rejected the hold of the churches over the people. He looked to the grandeur but also didn't balk at the cruelties of the ancient classical world, which of course he linked to the heroic values of Germanic myth. It was a world view that glorified strength conquest, dominance, at the expense of the weak, the feeble, and the disinherited. It was the crudest possible doctrine of the survival of the fittest, with the weak justifiably seen as going to the war. Though seen by the Nazis as a racial threat, a genetic threat, were to be wiped out by one means or another. Gassing methods were first tried out, not on Jews, but on the mentally sick. Target groups for racial engineering widened as time went on. Gypsies, homosexuals, antisocials, habitual criminals, and many others besides were included. But a special place in the pantheon of racial enemies was held by the Jews, was held by Hitler's own perceived arch enemies. The murder of the Jews, we can now see absolutely clearly, was intrinsic to Hitler's utopian vision. It's the prime example of something never previously encountered in history. The meticulously planned, state-directed attempt to wipe out an entire people and by modern industrialized killing methods. Goebbels described Hitler, uh, and quite rightly so, as the unswerving champion and spokesman of the final solution. But the Holocaust would have only marked a beginning. The general plan for the East, worked out by SS planners in the summer of 1941, envisaged no fewer than 31 million undesirables, as the Nazis saw them, untermenschen, mainly Slavs, being deported from Germany's new colonial territories. This was to take place over the following 25 years, and it wasn't imagined that many of these would last for too long in the Siberian wastes. Such a vision of inhumanity really now defies our imagination. But at the time, it was only too imaginable. And this was because Hitler's own boundless fantasy about the future German Reich breached all the moral and legal constraints that had shaped European civilization. It opened up the the floodgates to murderous initiatives of all kinds. When I was working on my biography, I used the uh, words of a Nazi functionary in 1934 to give some meaning to this. I took this term, working towards the Fuhrer, to sum up these preemptive initiatives. And I made that the cornerstone of my biography of Hitler. And the more you look at Hitler, the more the point strikes home. He alone was capable of such a monstrous vision. He alone had the imagination. He alone was prepared to think the unthinkable. He alone was prepared, ready, unhesitatingly, to take the most radical options, to burn his bridges behind him. But in presiding over such breathtaking inhumanity, 
all Hitler needed to do for much of the time was provide, to provide guidelines for action and to authorize the initiatives of others. We can now, I think, with the passage of time, see Hitler's place in history from another perspective. His end can seem to have been epochal. By that I mean it encapsulated a turning point in European and world history, it brought to an end one epoch and it ushered in another. Well, of course, it goes without saying, we shouldn't personalize this. Nor should we imagine that this was a change that took place overnight, a once and for all break with continuities. I haven't uh, now the time to go into this fully, but I think the old argument still holds valid. Hitler's rule had unwittingly brought about a revolution of destruction in Germany. And with that, Germany and also Europe began the crossing to a new era. The old continuities that had helped create Hitler, that had made Germany a problem for Europe and a key element in Europe's 30 years war of the 20th century, these were all shattered in the defeat and destruction. There was, of course, no Stunde Null, no zero hour when everything suddenly stopped and then started again in a different key. But within a decade of the war ending, a new Europe was emerging from the ruins of the old. And within that, of course, a new Germany. Much brutality, bloodshed, suffering, repression were still to be encountered on the way. But Hitler's revolution of destruction provided a starting point for these new structures and new values to evolve. It gave Europe and the divided Germany, most of all, the chance of a new beginning. Hitler's direct political legacy was the Cold War, and the Cold War was wound up between 1989 and 1991. It might have been thought that our preoccupation with Hitler would then have died off, would have gradually faded away. Instead, it's grown. Never since the war has there been so much about Hitler as in recent times. And it does seem, occasionally, to be a bit obsessive, all this. The danger of this is the over-personalizing of the catastrophic impact of the Third Reich. Historians, I think it's fair to say, have um, long since left behind over-personalized views of the Third Reich, the views, Hitler-centric views, that reduced the Third Reich to little more than the expression of the dictator's will. At the same time, the uh, counter-interpretation of Hitler as somehow um, a weak dictator, weak dictator, hesitant, indecisive, preoccupied largely with his own prestige, his own image. This view, I think, has always lacked some credibility. So, when I was doing my biography, what I tried to adopt was a new approach, one which could incorporate wider social and political forces while still doing justice to Hitler's unique personal role. Now, Hitler's importance in this view isn't diminished one jot. He's still the absolutely indispensable driving force. But it's not at all the picture of a madman now overriding the wishes of others. Hitler was a political fanatic with the immense power of the German state behind him not a madman. Unfortunately, till it was too late, large numbers of otherwise sane and rational people, among them many in Germany's uh, il power elites, in the military, for example, in the state bureaucracy, in, the, in, in industry and elsewhere, thought that what Hitler was doing was great. What he was doing was good. They endorsed and applauded his decisions. Most Germans acclaimed him. It's probably true to say that in the mid-1930s, Hitler was the most popular head of state in Europe. A leading German historian once said, it's unbearable to think that the will of a single madman plunged Germany into the war. That type of apologia, I think, is no longer tenable. But it's probably still not all that far from a prevalent popular view. Because in contrast to shifts in 
historical understanding, popular images of Hitler seem to me to have remained pretty static, remarkably unchanged across the decades. Well, carpet-biting madman, single-handedly driving Germany into war, taking the country down the road to perdition, massaging a totalitarian society totally in his grip. Maybe it's a bit of a parody, but it comes relatively close to summing it up. And the obsession with Hitler amounts at times less to a, a justifiable search for explanation of Europe's great catastrophe and more to a type of macabre fascination with his bizarre personality, which rapidly descends into trivia and, if you're not careful, distorts in historical interpretation through over-personalizing complex events and developments. This fascination can sometimes take quite weird forms. I've received, I don't know how many letters from people about my Hitler books, and some of them are zany to say the least. I was asked in one letter, did Hitler and Eva Brown drink Tokai wine on their wedding night? <laughs> this came from apparently someone who spent his time, his great hobby was collecting historical references to Tokai wine. <laughs> What's all that about? Or uh, another one that I've been repeatedly asked about in letters, did Hitler visit Liverpool in 1912? Well, this goes back to the old legend put around from the so-called memoirs of the unlikely named Bridget Hitler. Bridget Hitler was an Irish woman who got married, bigamous as it turned out, to Hitler's elder half-brother Alois. Bridget was um, doing a bit of gold digging. She wanted to make some money from her connections with the great dictator. And so she wrote about memoirs. And because there was nobody around who could check whether Liverpool had a visit from Hitler in 1912, she simply made it up. So I had to reply to these, but I always said that um, one of the things I couldn't imagine was Hitler on the terraces at Anfield, cheering on Liverpool, shouting, come on you Reds. <laughs> I'd also got another letter, um, another letter in, in insisting on the basis, it, it had a diagram as well, and it insisted on the basis of ear measurements and head measurements that Hitler was really Prince John who was the prematurely deceased son of King George V and Queen Mary. And this was a long diatribe which um, uh, got a very short answer, but it's, um, nonetheless, it's the sort of letter that, you, that betrays this um, unbelievable fascination with this type of macabre trivia. And the fascination with Hitler is kept alive through, of course, incessant media attention, Documentaries, films are legion. Bernd Eichinger's recent film called in this country Downfall, um, which personalizes Germany's end through uh, the end of the Third Reich through the drama in the bunker, was watched by over five million Germans. It was seen as sensational in Germany for treating Hitler as a human being. Well, what next? Hitler, a human being. Just when we all thought he was a monster from Mars. But what a specimen of humanity. He pats the Goebbels' children on the head, strokes Blondie, his dog that is, not Eva Brown, and he gives chocolates to his secretary. And then in the next breath, he gives out orders condemning tens of thousands of people to death. Still, peering into the strange inner world of, of, of Hitler evidently retains its fascination, even after all these years. And Hitler's a taboo figure like no other. So British newspaper editors dressing up as Hitler at office parties cause scandal, but they sustain the attention. The antics of a royal prince in Nazi uniform do much the same. Hitler, it might be said, has entered popular culture. And this is true of no other dictator, not even of Stalin. Hitler's become the very icon of evil. But that just enhances the fascination. The minutiae of his personal life, his medical condition, his women or men, friends, all these evoke endless and mainly fruitless speculation, but they retain the interest. It used to be thought that any book written about Hitler's sex life would probably be one of the shortest volumes ever composed. But a recent book, about 450 pages, which claimed to out Hitler as a practicing homosexual, 
just disprove that completely. And there's another one now which um, investigates the equally tenuous evidence that Hitler contracted syphilis from a prostitute in Vienna in about 1909 or 1910. So it's as if a Munich rent boy or a Viennese prostitute was somehow to be blamed for all the ills of the world that Hitler caused. Well, of course, in some ways, it can indeed help to focus historical understanding upon an iconic individual. But it can also lead to serious distortion, to an over-readiness to magnify the role of the individual in history at the expense of more complex developments, more complex causes of significant historical change. The tendency is extreme in the case of Hitler, and this is probably because of the extremes of the personality cult that were constructed by German propaganda and attached to Hitler in his own lifetime. From the point of view of German propaganda, everything about the Führer, all the achievements, so-called achievements of the Third Reich were attributed to the personal genius of the Führer. The opposite distortion is now the case. The tendency is there to attribute all the evil of Nazism to Hitler. In some ways, it seems almost as if the personality cult has persisted, but in reverse. So where Hitler was once seen as a superman, he's now a super demon. Where once he was a beloved leader, he's now the iconic hate figure. Where once he was a genius, he's now a madman, and so on. Now these images preclude a deeper understanding of how Nazism could grip German society at their worst, they're in danger of trivializing the past and distorting the present. Maybe they help to reinforce crude anti-German stereotypes, possibly even, you might say, they go some way towards skewing attitudes towards Europe through their caricaturing of Hitler and Nazism. So how then should we look upon Hitler's place in history? Well, primarily, I think there can be surely no doubt about this, primarily as the inspiration of the most lethal, most destructive war in history, of the most terrible genocide as well that the world has ever seen. Hitler left behind him not just physical ruination, but also moral ruination of a sort that the world has never previously experienced. He represented an extreme pathology of modern society. He showed us the most radical face of modern inhumanity, how, how an advanced society can undergo an absolutely breathtaking descent into modern barbarity quite without precedent. That's what, with the passage of time, we can surely come to see as historically defining about Hitler. Never before Hitler's time have we seen so clearly what human beings are capable of. Secondly, we do have to acknowledge that Hitler, I think we do anyway, that Hitler was an extraordinary individual, however repulsive. Every now and again through the ages, history has produced a remarkable individual, someone who shapes his era and then leaves a drastically altered society behind. And the crucial point in this, I think, is what I already mentioned, Hitler's apocalyptic vision of war as revenge and redemption to reverse the results of the First World War and, above all, to destroy those he held responsible for it. But a third point, we shouldn't mystify Hitler's personality. Nazism can't be reduced just to that strange personality. Another time, another place, and Hitler would have had no impact whatsoever. He couldn't have derailed a modern society without that society itself making a major contribution to its own fate. So what we can see is how special the conditions had to be to give Hitler his appeal, to make him the spokesman and representative for such widespread hopes and expectations, as well as these great fears and anxieties. At a time of comprehensive crisis of state and society, Hitler seemed to offer to many in Germany 
the prospect, the hopes of national salvation. Expectations, expectations of national rebirth were projected onto Hitler, and we can now see how time-bound these were. Well, that doesn't mean that we should be complacent, of course, about the present or the future. We are rightly appalled and horrified at new forms of fascism and racial intolerance. And these worry us and give us due grounds for concern. Even so, Nazism isn't on the march again. And future threats to world peace, as far as the eye can see, are unlikely to arise again within Europe. Sixty years on, the generation that might celebrate Hitler's memory and his reputation is still mercifully nowhere in sight. The world's a very different place. We're still captivated by Hitler's vision, but now in an entirely negative way. And this, too, is part of Hitler's legacy. We now have a society whose prime values, human rights and dignity, however much they're breached in practice, are the diametrical opposite to those of Hitler. The revolution of destruction that Hitler spawned and the symbol of evil that he's become have left him with a place in history that he never imagined. What will that place, though, look like when we come to the maybe 150th anniversary of Hitler's death? Using unseemly body counts, it's sometimes claimed, even now, that uh, Stalin was somehow worse than, than Hitler. Certainly, Hitler and Stalin can both be viewed as very different, very different spearheads of um, grotesquely inhumane forms of utopian social engineering. But it's as if somehow acknowledging the terrible crimes of Stalin should make us think that maybe Hitler wasn't so bad after all. So there is a concern, I think, that Hitler's evil will be relativized over time. It was once famously said that the Nazi past is a past that won't pass away. And that's been true until now. But as the generations that directly experienced Hitler's era pass away, so inevitably Hitler will become a part of detached history rather than a lasting emotional trauma. And with growing distance will, again, inevitably come shifting perspectives. We don't look at massacres and horrors of the distant past like we do those of yesterday. After all, we don't spend too much time in moral condemnation of Genghis Khan. So will we come in time to look more favorably on Hitler, just bypassing or overlooking the enormity of his crimes? Historians are good at only at predicting the past, well, sometimes. They know better than anybody else at looking into the future, that's for sure. No use of soothsayers. But what we can remind ourselves of is this fundamental, essential point, this essential point about Hitler, that Hitler represented the most fundamental, the most frontal assault ever launched on all that we associate with humanity and civilization. And unless those values are themselves undermined and destroyed in ways that we can't at present imagine, then even a hundred years from now, surely our descendants will still think of Hitler as the complete and total abnegation of all that they hold good and precious. Thank you very much for listening so patiently. Thank you very much, Ian, for such a fascinating talk. I know there's lots of people in the audience who've got questions they want to ask you. There's a gentleman there in the pit. Sorry. Do men make history, or does history make men? I, I don't know whether you've answered that question to my satisfaction. Well, it's a huge question. And, of course, it's a, naturally, it's a combination of things. So we have 
a set of circumstances the way in which an individual can operate. But let's say if there'd been a Reich Chancellor Hermann Goering, would the Holocaust have come about? Very probably not. Without Hitler, but with a very strongly nationalist uh, government in Germany, would there have been um, the final solution within eight years of that government taking office? Almost certainly not. Would um, there have been general European war by the end of the 1930s? Very probably not. Goering himself said in August 1939, Mein Führer, must we go verbank? Must we go for broke? And Hitler's reply was, Goering, you know all my life I've gone for broke. So with another leader, you'd have had, of course, revision of Versailles, but would you have had general European war that, so many, that many of the generals as well were wanted to pull back from? Probably wouldn't have happened under another, even nationalist leader. There would have been discrimination against Jews without the slightest doubt, legislation and so on. But there pro almost certainly would not have been the Holocaust. No Hitler, no Holocaust. Uh, but of course, without those conditions, no Hitler. So the two things go together, but once you've got the conditions, then it takes somebody with that type of imagination, warped imagination and strength of will to push these things through. And that was the point that when Hitler was giving these guidelines for action, everybody knew what Hitler stood for. It was the most radical of the alternatives. Lady here. Do you think there's a possibility that Hitler was mad? There was a possibility that Hitler was mad. Yeah. Um, the most thorough investigations that have been made of Hitler's uh, mental condition have come to the conclusion that, um, that he wasn't. Um, Hitler, for most of the time, was certainly an unusual individual, eccentric in all sorts of ways, but not mad. And the only time that that has been, this type of derangement has really been uh, pushed forward has been for the very last phase of his life and by then you had a society which has committed itself to the way that Hitler's gone. This was a society taking itself down to the road to perdition. It was a society doing that with the collaboration of so many others and it were quite patently not mad. So I don't think Hitler was mad and I don't think the madness really contributes, uh, thesis really contributes anything to understanding of the Third Reich. Okay, Any more questions? Uh, gentleman here. I was wondering, um, to what extent do you think he was personally responsible for the strategic errors which led ultimately to Germany's defeat in the Second World War? The one strategic error, the colossal strategic error that everybody would point to, I suppose, is uh, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of uh, Soviet Union in 1941. Um, after that, they came thick and fast, but I mean, that's the one that set the parameters for it. Some of the generals thought that was a mistake, but nobody spoke up against it. Um, but, uh, but not only that, but now from, from December 94 onwards, he takes charge of tactics as well as strategy. And there's no other um, war leader. Stalin didn't do it. He backed away from that as the war went on. Churchill didn't do it and so on. No, nobody else was actually running a state um, and in charge of military tactics. What you needed were the professionals who would then look for the right retreats to better fighting position and so on. Hitler was incapable of thinking in that way, so it was always fight it out, hold out, don't give an inch, and all the rest of it. And that's when it just went from calamitous to totally catastrophic. Mr. Gentleman, there in the pit. I notice you don't mention any of the propaganda uh, against the organizations of the German working class. Uh, you, you say it was just against the Jews, but surely the, the, uh, the propaganda was directed uh, against Jews and against Bolsheviks, and the two of them were tied together. There were Bolshevik Jews that were overcoming, overthrowing the, the, the German nation. Yes, of course. Thank you. It's a good point. The, um, the first um, victims and the first uh, opponents of the Nazis when they came to power were, in a systematic fashion, not Jews, but the political opponents of the left, of the political left. And it wasn't simply a matter of associating all these with uh, Bolsheviks. Bolsheviks were still largely seen as Russian. So the figment of imagination that he had about Russia was Russia run by Bolshevik Jews. So Bolsheviks and Jews were one and the same thing for him. In Germany, uh, Marxism went for him much wider than simply the communists, and uh, he saw it as a major 
uh, the major um, first step was to combat the political enemies on the left, and those included the Social Democrats. So the first wave, tens of thousands of people uh, put in concentration camps in uh, the spring of 1933. Uh, these were, in their vast uh, numbers, um, communists in the first instance and then Social Democrats. It's one of the big popular misconceptions, isn't it, in this country, don't you think, this confusion about the role of the concentration camps and the death camps. A lot of people will say the concentration camps set up in 1933, everyone must have known they were exterminating the Jews and so on. And yet so many people we've once met, not former Nazis, not just former Nazis, ordinary Germans, actually see the concentration camps in those early years as a very positive thing. Yes, uh, I mean, the, there, is, there is obviously that difference. The, the concentration camps are absolutely horrific places, absolutely horrific places. And 30 odd thousand people died in, in Dachau between 1933 and 1945. Uh, but they were very different in their function from the extermination camps. There were lots and lots of concentration camps by the end all over the continent and some very big ones in, in Germany. But the extermination camps, uh, Kelmano, um, Treblinka, Sobibor, Belshesh, Majdanek, Auschwitz-Birkenau. These were very different in their function, that they existed to kill people in great numbers, They're very different from the concentration camps. As you mentioned, the concentration camps were meant to be known about. It was meant to be a deterrent. So when the concentration camp at Dachau, the first was opened in March 1933, it was in the papers, this is open, and this is what happen, will happen to you if you, if, you don't, if you don't tell the lie, and you'll be sent to Dachau, and nobody knew precisely what went on there, except that it was uh, a nasty place. So um, the, there, is that, there was that difference in function, and of course the, the extermination camps arose at a much later stage in 1941 in um, the occupied parts of uh, Poland, and um, with this um, now function of simply uh, exterminating Jews and, and others described as, uh, as um, uh, seen as un indescribables. I think uh, gentleman here in the glasses. Uh, even with the most tyrannical of despots in history, uh, somebody can normally find something good to say about them. Is there anything positive in the contribution that history, um, Hitler has made to history? Well, as they always say, the motorways, Autobahn. Um, but even those weren't Hitler's invention. Of course, he simply well, took them over uh, from the copy of the Italians, and um, it, uh, he was very keen to latch on to the suggestion. The plans were already um, in existence when he took power. But, I mean, that's, that's in danger of um, reinventing the old legend that uh, when Hitler was around, the streets were free of crime, he built the motorways, he cleared off unemployment, and so on. The point to keep in mind about this is that it's all part of the end which came, which was inexorable. So you can't detach those. So ultimately, there is nothing that we can say was good about Hitler. Thank you, Ian. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, apart from the most important task of all, which is for us to thank Ian Kershaw for such a stimulating lecture. For a free magazine about all open university programs, call 08700 100 878 or go to open2.net where you'll find further debate from the lecture. There's more from Professor Ian Kershaw in just a moment as he joins a panel of UK historians to discuss whether World War II happened because of Hitler or because of the unique circumstances at the time. The debate, chaired by Lawrence Rees, is next. It's an amazing world when you think about it. Documentaries on BBC4. Everybody needs a place to think. How much is an empty bottle of water worth? To him, it's the price of an evening meal. Stories from India's monsoon railway, coming soon to BBC4.
BBC Four 